November 13th, 2022, four University of Idaho students were stabbed to death inside their off-campus residence. Ethan, Zanna, Maddie, and Kaylee, all gone. The brutal crime shook the community and touched the nation, setting off an intense manhunt for a killer. Investigators from the Moscow Police Department joined forces with the Idaho State Police and the FBI, following every lead, every tip, and every piece of evidence. That investigation took them across the country to Pennsylvania and led them to this man, a grad student at a neighboring university. This man is now accused of being a mass murderer responsible for one of the most notorious crimes on our docket. He's facing a potential death sentence and his attorneys are fighting hard. And now they say they have a specific alibi. Tonight, we'll take a look at that alibi and match it up against the prosecution theory of what happened. Then, we'll take a look at the shocking claim by the defense that there is exculpatory evidence in this case that will prove the accused killer's innocence. We'll break it down with our experts as we investigate the Idaho student murders. I'm Vinnie Politan. This is Closing Arguments, and wow. We had the breaking news last night in the show, and we've had some time to dig through this and figure out exactly what it means and what's being said here. We're talking about the Idaho student's murder case. We're talking about the alibi of the accused killer. Now remember, this was a brutal attack in the early morning hours. These young people, these kids, these students did nothing wrong. They were living their lives. They were doing well at school. One was ready to leave and, and begin work. They were friends. They helped each other. They were there for each other. And this happened. A stranger in the house in the middle of the night, for what reason? What is the motive here? Why would someone do this? We don't know the answer. You may never know that answer as to why the answer may be in who did it and what's, what's going on up here. But there was no interaction. There was no crossing of their lives. There was nothing like that going on. There's no, it's not revenge. It's not spite. It's whatever it is, it was all in the killer's mind. Now, small town investigators here, they got help but they did amazing work. They used video, surveillance video, GPS tracking, you know, through cell phones, doing that triangulation and, and figuring out where this, where this uh, vehicle was, where it was spotted on video and, and, and how that matched up with the cell phone data of the suspect in this case. And they were able to follow that movement. At some point, they lose track of the, of the phone. The phone is not communicating, but they have more surveillance video. And they put this together to, to paint a picture of what happened, to put together a timeline. And reading through the affidavits, and we did this months and months and months ago. It was January of 2023. It makes sense. The story they're telling makes sense based upon the evidence they say they have. Like it, it logically flows from point A to point B to point C to point D in matching this defendant to the evidence in the case. It all seems to fit together very nicely. Now, one of the key aspects of this whole case, and you remember when the nation was looking for a white Elantra, the killer's car, I mean, anyone who was driving a white Elantra at that time was like, oh boy, especially anyone in that area. Turns out the white Elantra ended up in Pennsylvania, but was out there. Big piece of this case because of the surveillance video. You're able to see the white Elantra. You see the car. You match the car with the defendant. Oh, the defendant has a white Elantra. Oh, we've got video of him leaving his apartment. Oh, his cell phone data is matching that. Like they put the pieces together here. And it seemed like a 
and still seems to me like a very strong circumstantial case. Now, of course, there's also the DNA, but we're not dealing with the DNA tonight because we haven't heard what the defense is going to, how they're going to fight that. We know how overwhelmingly important that evidence is and how strong it is. I believe it's the biggest piece of evidence, but they put these other pieces together to track this accused killer. So what's the takeaway from these papers that were filed yesterday? It's him saying I wasn't there. I wasn't there. And what's amazing here is that in most cases where, where you're alleging an alibi, usually you establish that alibi with a witness. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's the, the, the server at the restaurant. It's the person who was helping you try on a pair of sneakers at Foot Locker. I don't know, whoever it is. But in this case, the alibi witness ends up being an expert witness who is analyzing cell phone data. I don't think he's going to testify about his own alibi. I really don't. I think they're going to establish it through this expert witness who becomes an expert alibi witness. A little unusual, but so is he. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at it. And what I want to do now is match up his alibi with the prosecution's version of interpreting this evidence and putting it together and where they say he was and where he says he was. And it seems like it's two different places. Let's take a look. Um, the accused killer was out driving in the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022, as he often did to hike and run and or see the moon and stars. He drove throughout the area south of Pullman, Washington, west of Moscow, Idaho, including Wawai Park. Okay, so they've, they've established. This is where they're saying he was at the time. Here's the, let's put this all on a map now and we'll, we'll compare the two. And, and we'll begin by taking a look at the prosecution. And, and this is from the probable cause affidavit using cell phone data and video surveillance to track the accused killer here. His apartment in Pullman, Washington to Moscow, Idaho via 270, the Pullman, Moscow connector to the crime scene. That's, that's where they say he's driving, on that road. So he's driving from the west to the east. Moscow and the crime scene, the house is east of where he lives. Then goes south on 95, then west towards Uniontown. Then he takes, he goes northwest back to his residence in Pullman. So it was, it was this big loop that we were, we were talking about. You go to the east, because he's out all night. You go to the east, you go to the south, then you got to go northwest to go back home. What is he saying? Oh, well, take a look, that, that he's, he's not going that way. He's going west of Pullman, south of Pullman, um, to Wawai Park. Like, look at these two versions. The green is what he's saying he did that night. The yellow is what the prosecution is saying he did that night. How could that be? Let's bring in some experts. Joining me tonight in Arlington, Virginia, Director of Digital Forensics for Hive International, Sam Brothers is with us. In Jacksonville, Alabama, forensic death investigator, professor of forensics for Jacksonville State University, host of the Body Bags podcast, Joseph Scott Morgan. And finally, in Portland, Oregon, true crime live streamer, Gray Hughes, who you can find on Gray Hughes Investigates. Watch it on YouTube with thousands and thousands of others, folks. All right, great to have everyone here. Thank you so much. Sam, let me begin with you. Big picture question, okay? I've watched trials for years. I know both sides hire experts, but in this area of, of, of looking at cell phone data and trying to figure out where someone is, how much of it is definitive, how much of it is interpretive, sort of like straight up black and white science here, 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 versus interpreting things and, and, and placing people in different places based upon the data from the phone. Yeah, thanks, Penny. 
one, I think one of the big challenges here is, or one of the challenges isn't going to be putting him behind that keyboard or putting him his phone there. He said, um, I think he's already claimed that he turned his phone off at some point um, during this. There's additional data that hasn't yet been released uh, from this gentleman that's yet to be examined and analyzed. And I think that additional information that has yet to be analyzed is either going to corroborate what this gentleman's saying or it's not. And the based on what he's saying and based on the cases I've seen, this would be highly unusual. Um, but I'd, I'd really rather see the rest of the information to make that, that call one way or the other. Um, How about in general, though? How about in general? Because I know... I know in my heart of hearts, when this trial comes, the defense is going to have an yeah, expert, be. the prosecution is going to have an expert. What should we think here? Yeah, it, it really, it should be, you know, those those kinds of things, you, I expect that, that data to be there or it's not going to be there. Gotcha. Um, Joseph Scott Morgan, your thoughts about this? Um, let, me, let me give you something else here, uh, Joseph. Well, why County Park? We have some information about the park tonight. Let's take a look. Well, why County Park sits in the Snake River Canyon? I remember that from uh, Evil Knievel days. Uh, approximately <laughs> three miles Good upstream well. from Lower yeah. Granite Dam. The park, now this is, this is what I'm wondering about. The park is open from 7 a.m. to dusk and for overnight camping year round. This is a gated park with no access into or out of the park from dusk yeah. until 7 a.m. Hmm, but he's kind of saying that's where he goes to run and stargaze in the middle of the night. Yeah, do you, hey, keep that image up on the screen, Vin. That uh, producers did a great job with this. Do you see that white post that's behind the sign? That's the gate. That's the gate that would be locked up in the evening. You'd have a ranger that would come by and lock this thing up. And so that leaves, that begs the question, if you're going to this park to stargaze, um, are you just going to sit on the side of the road and stargaze there? I mean, I guess he could because there, you know, there's there's not going to be any kind of man-made light out there. It's a rural area. But he, it, here's here's the big problem, Vin. That night there was ice, fog, and there was also the skies were overcast. In addition to that, it was a waning gibbous moon. And if for folks that don't know what that is, it's, it's phasing out of full moon. It's it's waning. And so the gibbous moon is, it's kind of, when you see the moon, it looks like it's got a big bulge. It's very distinctive. And I'd be fascinated to know, you know, what the, what other people saw that night, you know, and it would anybody testify to the environment out there? Because I got to tell you, it, it doesn't look like it would be ideal for observing the skies at all. And on the same phone, uh, I've done this with my son over the years. You remember when the app came out years ago where you could download the thing to check the heavens, you know, and it would, you could look up at the sky and, you know, you could pick out all the, all the, uh, you know, all, all of the features in the sky, wherever you are geographically. I wonder if he had that on his phone. Uh, or unless he just, he had mapped out the sky and the night sky so well in his brain. He would just sit there and maybe contemplate it. It seems mighty thin to me, Ben. Well, let's put some of that weather up on the screen. Justice Scott Morgan, um, he's going to give us the five day in the next segment. Um, the weather in Pullman, Washington, November 13th, 2022, high of 32, low of 28, cloudy. Zero precip, though, is, is what we found in the, uh, in, in the records. All right, Gray Hughes, I don't think you're buying this alibi. Am, am, I, no. am I correct in my intuition here? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that park would be a great place to maybe discard a knife, for example, uh, or later in the morning after he... Uh, see, there's a point where he drove all the way down to Clarkston and Lewiston, right? And then he drives up and there's a five hours of missing time and he kind of goes up in that area and his phone ping near Johnson, uh, Washington, which is just uh, east of that park. Okay, but here's the thing. We know 
that Brian Koberger's vehicle was in Moscow, Idaho. Okay, he um, his, he turned off his phone. That's why it's not pinging over there. And we see a vehicle that shows up at uh, I think it's 327 off of um, uh, let's see what's the name of that street, Indian Hills Drive. And then eventually works its way to one. And you're talking about the video, road. right? The, the video evidence, the, the surveillance yeah, videos that yeah, exist. Yeah, exactly. So we're going yeah, to get into that in just a second. We're going to get into that in just a second. We got a whole thing lined up for you, Greg. Um, <laughs> right, I want to right. read for you, though, from uh, the Gonzalez family uh, released a statement, and this is part of it from their attorney, Shannon Gray. Uh, a big part of this has been waiting on the alibi information. Now that it's here, we feel even more confident in the prosecution of the defendant. The defense's claim is that the defendant was driving late at night, hiking, running, and stargazing. We are not sure why it has taken over a year for this to come out, as those don't seem to be complicated activities. We believe that if this alibi had any weight, it would have been submitted months ago. It also, in direct conflict with the probable cause affidavit that states the defendant's phone was turned off between 2.47 a.m. and 4.48 a.m. So if the defendant was driving around and there is cell phone information that he was in a different place, it would either be before or after the times of the murders, hence not really an alibi. So what's interesting here, Gray, is they're going to attempt to establish this alibi without him testifying. That's what I believe, that he's going to avoid that witness stand and do it through his expert witness who's going to have to do it through, through this information. Now, just the fact that he is, he's saying he is in the complete opposite direction, to me, is, is telling. Like, it's like, no, I didn't drive through or, you know, yeah, I may have passed through there, but I was on my way to somewhere else. It seems he's saying he was nowhere near there, which, which to me is, was, was a little shocking. When I was thinking they were going to talk about an alibi, I thought there would be some concession of some of this, but there's zero. Are you surprised that there's zero concession from the accused killer that he was actually drove to the east and was driving through Moscow at all that night? I am. I think it's absolutely uh, ridiculous. Um, like I was saying before, at 326 at, on Indian Hills Drive, and then he makes his way back to 1122 King Road. And remember that? We did the show a while back where he does the four loops around. He does those four loops. And then at 408, the white Elantra that they've tracked stops right by the house. And then at 420, it drives away. So that means inside of that 12-minute period, Ethan Chapin, Xander Cronaldo, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonzalez were all murdered. And... Guess what? In that same 12-minute period of time, a knife sheath was left on the bed that has Brian Koberger's DNA on it, which verifies that that white Elantra driving around was his. It yeah. has to, right? It's I mean, the, the, I mean, it, sometimes, yeah. sometimes two plus two equals four, yeah. but sometimes in a courtroom it doesn't. I've seen that. But the DNA, they, they have to come up with something for the DNA. And I say come up with because unless... The DNA is planted, or the testing was completely wrong, or I, I, I don't know their explanation for that yet, but I'm sure we'll find out. In the meantime, the good news, all our experts staying with us. When we come back, um, there was something else in the alibi papers that were filed, and it includes what I believe will be the biggest legal battle before this trial starts. We're gonna talk about that when we come back, plus coming up next hour. In Boise, Idaho, another huge day in the courtroom in the Doomsday Prophet murder trial as the woman closest to the Doomsday couple, Melanie Gibb, takes the stand. And looking at that, does that refresh your recollection about discussing, protecting someone in this case? That sounds familiar. We are underway in the trial of Doomsday Prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Lori, I could ever come up with this. His wife, Lori Valo Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the Doomsday Prophet Chad Daybell on trial.
do need to remember, though, is that anything you do say other than to your lawyers could be used against you in a later court proceeding. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. You also have a right to appeal any final decision of the court, but in order to exercise that right, you need to file a notice of appeal within 42 days of that final decision or that right is waived. Also, if you are not a United States citizen, any finding of guilt in this state could have adverse consequences to your legal status. Do you understand these rights? Yes. Any questions about the rights? No. No questions. I have a few questions about his alibi, though. Filed all of the papers relative to the alibi defense. We're going through them now in great detail. We have a great panel with us. Let me go through more of this supplemental response to the state's alibi demand. The state said, if you want to say alibi, you've got to give us the information. So here it is. The accused killer intends to offer testimony of Cy Ray. Cy Ray, that's a man's name, is the CSLI expert to show that the killer, the accused killer's mobile device was south of Pullman, Washington and west of Moscow, Idaho on November 13th, 2022. So it seems like Cy Ray already has that information. And also to show that the accused killer's mobile device did not travel east on the Moscow Pullman Highway in the early morning hours of November 13th and thus could not be the vehicle captured on video. Conceding that there's a, a, a vehicle captured on video along the Moscow Pullman Highway near Floyd's Cannabis Shop. Good old Floyd's. Uh, additional information. This is the part I think is perhaps the most significant in looking at what's going to happen in the litigation lead up to this trial. Additional information as to uh, the accused killer's whereabouts uh, as the early morning hours progressed, including additional analysis. So that means he's done analysis already uh, by Mr. Ray, will be provided once the state provides discovery requested and now subject to an upcoming motion to compel. This is what Sam Brothers was talking about, this additional information they want. But here's what they're saying. If not disclosed, this additional information that they're requesting, if not disclosed, Mr. Ray's testimony will also reveal that critical exculpatory evidence further corroborating Mr. the accused killer's alibi was either not preserved or has been withheld. It seems that their expert already has the opinion that the stuff that they haven't seen is exculpatory because if he doesn't get it, he's going to say it's exculpatory. I don't understand that. But it may be relative to this, what we know from the probable cause affidavit. At approximately 2.47 a.m., the phone stops reporting to the network, which is consistent with either the phone being in an area without cellular coverage, the connection to the network is disabled, such as putting the phone in airplane mode, or that the phone is turned off. So in the PC affidavit, they're saying, well, there's three potential reasons. We believe he turns it off, but these are the three ways that you would lose um, or, or the, the phone would stop reporting to the network. But their expert seems to be saying, I know you have this evidence, and if we don't get it, I'm going to tell the jury and everyone else that it's exculpatory. I don't understand that. Let's bring back in our guest, Sam Brothers, expert, director of digital forensics for Hive International, Joseph Scott Morgan, Jacksonville State University, you know him, Gray Hughes, true crime live streamer. Um, all right, Sam, can you explain that to me? Is it possible that this expert that they have knows that he's looking for something, and if you don't give it to me, I know it's exculpatory. Like, what is it? What exactly is it? I don't, I'm yeah, not following that. Remember before, yeah, I remember before you were talking about black and white, um, this this goes back to that uh, exactly, and we'll f if there's there's logs there that are in that device that will tell us if that device was taken off the network summarily, as it says there in that affidavit, and we can make that determination if given full access to the device. So if we need Wait, a let me special master, there. I want to go. I want to go slowly here, and it's and it's and it's you're not doing anything yeah. wrong. It's me. I want to understand. Sure. So what you're saying is the experts should be able to figure out if it was, if the phone was put in airplane mode, turned off, 
or out of an area? Yes, there, we should be able to make that determination if given full access to that device. Okay, and is there anything else from there that you believe that, like why would this expert be saying, listen, you guys have something that you haven't given us, and if you don't give us, I know it's exculpatory. I know it proves his innocence. You know, I, I, I think what you're getting at is there's information there that's exculpatory that he doesn't want to give up because it doesn't make his case look so great. Um, and I, that is the only reason I could think of. That's probably not so great for him. I would hope that, you know, he would give that information up and just put, put forward to light what needs to be put forward and just bring the facts forward and let the facts speak for what they are. That's absolutely all. It's pretty absolutely simple. joseph it's scott morgan your thoughts on this issue because i this is this is the big thing right during the time when all this is taking place the, the the phone is not communicating with the networks right prosecutors yep. obviously believe because when killers that have half a brain are going to do something they turn their phone off um what are your thoughts about this potential evidence that the defense believes will be exculpatory. You know, I, I'm really wondering, there's there's part of me that, that has been uh, thinking, how does the car play into this? Uh, it's a 2015 Elantra, Elantra. And, you know, what what type of data was that vehicle registering? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I've heard a couple of people say that in 15, the onboard CPU that keeps track of data was an optional, was an option on this thing. I don't know if it's equipped with that. And I'm really wondering if, if there is data contained, if they did a data dump on the car to try to determine if that data marries up or runs parallel to what they believe was going on with the cellular device. And as far as turning it on and off, this sort of thing, I would think that <clears throat> someone that has you know that many outlets have purported to be some kind of criminal mastermind would not have brought their phone with them in the first place they would have known better they would have left it at their apartment and you wouldn't be having this issue now then all you would have would be the videography which by the way is not very good um, my understanding is there was not a plate capture during this period of time um, so again, that, that could be a problem for the prosecution, but the fact that he's merely, the expert is merely throwing out there that there, uh, that there is exculpatory data that they're not being provided. Uh, it's, it's big and it's tantalizing, but I, I just don't know, you know, really, uh, how much meat's on the bone there from an evidentiary standpoint. Yeah. I mean, that's a powerful word inside of a courtroom when you're arguing to a judge about exculpatory evidence. These cases have been litigated to the Supreme Court. You need to hand it over. And I'm, yep. I'm, I am really confused by what this expert is saying. All right. Uh, hey, look, I gotta say, Vin, I, I don't know, you know, this might be a move that is just, they're trying to be provocative with this, you know, relative to uh, how they're attacking this case. That is the defense, you know, because what they're doing is a blame game. You know, well, we don't have everything that we need. You need to turn it over. And again, maybe they're just being provocateurs, you know, in this case. Gray Hughes, you know, I'm reading this and it seems like this expert has already done some analysis and his preliminary analysis puts him over near Wawai Park. And they say, wait a minute, wait a minute, prosecutors, you have more. You haven't given us everything. You need to give us this stuff because I know that this is the exculpatory evidence. This is going to put him somewhere else for the whole night, including the time in question. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, I, I think I actually looked this guy up and there's some cases where the judge threw out all the information that he put on the case. Like one time he, there was a case where he um, highlighted where a an ex-husband or something was a stalker and he, he placed him in the area of the home. But the, uh, I think it was in this case the defense, because this was a he was a prosecution witness in that case. Right. The defense was able to show that um, 
with GPS coordinates, he was nowhere near that. And GPS coordinates are absolutely like really accurate, not cell phone data. So the cell phone data that he generated, and so when I read this, uh, what, what, it wasn't accurate. So when I read this, to me, it seems like what he's saying is that um, you know, he wants to see what the state has first, then he'll do his analysis of it. Because, but if you don't send it in, I'll say how the information you didn't share was exculpatory. That's what it seems like he's trying to do. It's a threat, basically. And, and the bottom line is, I mean, the way our system of justice works is prosecutors give everything to the defense. And if it's something that is exculpatory or potentially exculpatory, they absolutely have to provide it. If they don't, I mean, cases have been tossed for such conduct. And if you do it on purpose, you can lose your law license. I mean, there's a lot of stuff at stake here. Sam, um, I want to give you the final word on this issue. Um, how do you think this thing, what, what, is, what, is the, what is the key data that is needed here to absolutely figure out where that cell phone was? Um, actually, I think one of the key things here to this case is going to be, especially tying him to this alibi of, going looking at stars and things like that will be what's called pattern of life so if he's going to tell me he's looking at stars i'm going to be looking in that phone for key vocabulary uh, of i expect him to have that type of vocabulary and i also expect to do a that deep analysis on that phone to answer your question um i i expect to see um, a lot more of that information that corroborates that that uh the, the locations. All right, Sam Brothers, Hive International, Director of Digital Forensics. Appreciate your time tonight. Uh, Joseph Scott Morgan, Gray Hughes staying with us. When we come back, um, Gray Hughes has been talking about the video. We're gonna show his videos. It's amazing stuff. But my real question tonight is, could there actually be a second white Elantra that's cruising around the early morning hours in the Moscow, Moscow Pullman area? Really, is that possible? Through our tips, through our leads, some of the evidence that came in, we start to identify patterns. And like we said earlier, we are confident that the occupant or occupants of that vehicle have information that's critical to, to this investigation. We also understand that even though there's some, sometimes a fascination with a particular case, some people simply don't see the news and may not know that we're looking for it. So if we get the word out there, hey, maybe your neighbor has one in the garage that they don't drive very often. Maybe um, the, there's one that's just not on the registration database. Let us know. So far, we have a, a, a list of approximately 22,000 registered white Hyundai Elantras that fit into our uh, criteria that we're sorting through. That's, a, that's an awful lot of information, but it may not be all of them. So the public uh, can help us with that. That's when they were searching for this white Elantra. And what blew my mind, uh, what Captain Lanier was saying, 22,000 of them. So, okay, I guess it's possible there's a second white Elantra that we're talking about here. Um, but in the probable cause affidavit, uh, the prosecution really laid out uh, through this document um, what their video surveillance they believe shows. And it really traces and tracks um, this, this suspect vehicle number one making all these passes and going to all these different places. So I want to show you some images here because um, there is one video that we have our hands on, uh, thanks to, to Gray Hughes, who's with us tonight. Um, take a look, and, and this video is a, a still image. It shows you s the vantage point of the camera that we're gonna be talking about here, and you can see from it the image, just under the lettering there, of that suspect vehicle number one. Now let me show you the path that it may have taken uh, as, it, as this vehicle passed the scene multiple times that night. Uh, and you see where Queen Road is and where the dot is, that's the crime scene. So you can see how you can enter the crime scene, sort of loop around Walenta Drive, and how you could enter um, that crime scene. Now what I wanna show you right now is where the, where the surveillance camera uh, actually was located uh, of the video we're gonna show you. So there you see the crime scene, that's the house. 
and then you see 1330 Linda Lane, that's where the security camera is, okay? And so when you see these, these images of a vehicle passing in the early morning hours, that's where it is relative to the crime scene. Um, so let's do this first. Um, Gray Hughes took that drive um, down that path. Let's take a look at the, the drive you took. And I think in the midst of this, um, you show us the actual uh, vantage point of the surveillance camera. So where exactly is this, Gray? Yeah, this is right uh, in front of 500 Queen Road. And you're, this is exactly the route that the White Elantra did, I think, four different times. I switched to daylight so you can see what it looks like. But you can see there's a, a route back behind the building there. And then there's the vehicle on camera. And now I switch back to dark. I just wanted you to get different perspectives of it so you can see it during the daylight and nighttime. Now, right when it turns here, um, off to the left, you'll see it. That The house is actually right there to the left through those woods. You can just barely see the whiteness of it there on the left. Okay. And so I think it stopped for a couple of minutes on each pass and sat here looking through the window to make sure, see who, if the lights were turned off or uh, there was still movement in the house. I think he was just waiting for all the lights to go off before he went in. Now, Joseph Scott Morgan, you, you think about passing several times. Like, what are your thoughts about the mind of the killer? circling, 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 because there's past two, there's past three. Um, and, and, and then there's, you know, the big one uh, when it turns in front of, of, the, of the crime scene. What are your thoughts about the mind of the killer in those moments? If an individual was purposed to go in to that residence on Kings Road, I think that, and they had planned it, uh, they would be searching for any signs of motion, uh, anyone else that may be coming or going out of that residence. Let's think about the food delivery. Uh, and I think that potentially they would be looking perhaps for lights to go out. And some of us had thought perhaps that if you go to the rear up on the hill, that you could have a vantage point from that location to look back down into the house and any lights that would be on, uh, it would illuminate anything within that residence if you're sitting in the dark and perhaps waiting for that final light to go out, I think is key here. Again, this is an indication of somebody perhaps that is waiting and biding their time until they feel very, very comfortable with it. All right, great, let's go through these passes. Let's start with pass number two. This is the surveillance video, 338 to 339. Um, what are we seeing here? It's gonna pull in and take a right and you'll see it drive by just on the left over there. So you see the lights coming down. That's that 500 Queen Road, that straightaway. And then it takes a right and you'll see it actually drive by right there on the left side by that wall. There's a little bit of a wall right there. You can see the top of it. And it may, does that uh, two more times after this, but then it actually turns around and goes back the other direction. But I guess we'll see that in the order it happens. Uh, let's go to pass number right. three. We're gonna put them right in order. We're gonna go to number three now. Here's the, the third pass. And again, we're talking about this, you know, sort of circling motion here. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing, we're starting to see some lights. That's the suspect vehicle. Yeah, it's gonna be driving this direction. And that, there was about 16 or 17 minutes between that pass uh, so it was a little longer than the first pass so it could be that the car drove further away there's indication that the car drove by a gas station uh, to the east so here it is making the third pass and then it leaves the area again and then and now we the flash next... forward yeah to 405 which is you know about seven eight minutes later with uh, pass number four let's watch this one yeah, and this absolutely matches the probable cause exactly what it says. It does initial three passes, then it drives back here, turns around. So you'll see it do this. So that you can actually see the entire white Elantra as it stopped right back here. Right there, yes. So there it is. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. You can you can see the whole vehicle, and then it backs up. And this isn't the three-point turn that's mentioned in the probable cause yet it is a three-point turn all it said was it turned around in this area 
and then it goes back out in front of 500 Queen Road, and then and then it heads towards uh, King Road, and it does a, a sort of tries to stop or park, but it doesn't do that. Then it does a three-point turn at Queen and King Road, and then heads back for its final pass. Yeah, let's yeah. take a look at that final pass, and as we're watching it, Joseph Scott Morgan, the one thing Gray and I know you talked about last time, it, it seems to be moving a little bit faster at this point. Like the adrenaline is running. Yeah, maybe coming to the final conclusion, this is the last, you know, kind of, if you will, orbit that the individual driving this vehicle is going to make uh, be before they make entry into the residence. And look at those times uh, at, at the top. Uh, by the way, kudos to, to Gray. He did a jam up job with this, having, having access to this. This is fantastic. Uh, you know, it, it, it'd be a grand thing if, you know, with all of the video surveillance, if we had a clearer view of things, but, uh, you know, the cars just didn't fall that way. Right. But yet you have this interesting vehicle, this unique vehicle, well, 22,000 of them. So yeah. we'll see where <laughs> it goes. We'll see where it goes. We're out of time for tonight. Gray Hughes, true crime live streamer. Gray Hughes investigates Joseph Scott Morgan, Body Bags podcast. Thank you both so much.